Hey everyone. In today's video, we'll be uh, applying some of our knowledge of vector addition to solve some problems, uh, maybe some kinds of problems you might have seen in a physics course. So let's get started. So um, some common areas we might uh, use vector addition. And to be honest, um, um, in applications like this with ships and aircraft, and um, plotting bearings and whatnot. Um, winds and currents are always changing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and vector addition comes into play a lot, but because they're always changing, um, it'd be impractical for, uh, you know, air traffic controllers and stuff to be constantly solving uh, vector problems by hand. Uh, so um, software and programs that help with that are often, they're, they're, they're programmed. Um, but having knowledge of this can help you be like possibly one of those engineers that, you know, um, uh, writes these programs and maintains them. Um, but knowing uh, how to add vectors uh, is an absolute must in these kinds of fields. Um, we're, uh, all the problems we're doing today will be modeled with triangles. Uh, sometimes they'll be modeled with oblique triangles, which have an obtuse angle in them. And we'll be using all our trigonometry skills, right angle triangle trigonometry, and sine law, cosine law to solve problems today. So uh, let's get started. Um, we've talked about the resultant. Uh, one term that might come into play over the next uh, few days is the e equilibrant. Uh, the equilibrant vector is one that balances another vector or a combination of vectors. It is equal to the magnitude but opposite in direction to the resultant. So resultant and equilibrant are opposite vectors. If you add the equilibrant and resultant, because they're opposite, you get the zero vector. And uh, in the same way, if you add, so you can see in this diagram here, we have two forces being resolved into one singular kind of like net force or resultant. If you added F1 plus F2 plus the equilibrant, you could get zero. So again, the equilibrant balances all the other vectors in a problem. So we're going to do uh, an example here. Uh, we're just going to find the resultant for this clown being launched out of a cannon. So um, we're going to make a, a couple of assumptions here. So while the clown's in the cannon, we're going to assume that there, we, we've, we've given that while he's in the cannon, this, he's got this uh, horizontal force of uh, 2,000 newtons. And um, that's the only horizontal force. So people have taken physics might be asking, well, what about friction? What about this? What about that? We're just going to ignore that for the moment. And the vertical force is acceleration due to gravity. And so we'll have a second force acting down. And uh, most of you guys, at least, um, I believe so, have taken at least grade 11 physics. And you guys learned in that course that the force of gravity is an object on, a, on an object is its mass times acceleration due to gravity. In this case, the clown is 80 kilograms. For this problem, we'll use 9.8 for the acceleration due to gravity, 80 times 9.8, 784. So a bit of a like simplified physics problem. I know some of you guys can recognize there might be a lot more forces going on, but we're going to keep it simple for this one. So our goal initially in part A is to find the resultant. So like the net force in this case, it'll be down to the right, but we want to know how big it is and we want to know what direction it's in. Uh, so uh, because this problem is broken down into like a horizontal component and a vertical component, we know this is a right angle triangle formed by these two vectors, adding them and getting the resultant. So we can use right angle triangle trigonometry. The magnitude of the resultant, we'll just use Pythagorean theorem. So the root of 2000 squared plus 784 squared, whatever that is. And then we're interested in the direction. Again, we've I've got an arrow on this resultant. That's important. It's going down to the right. So mm -hmm. uh, we can now use any, we, it, once you find the magnitude of R, 
that's the hypotenuse. I'm just going to use the I'm just going to use the tan ratio because I have originally those two values and they're pretty close to exact. Mm -hmm. So I'll be using tan opposite over adjacent. And so let's do those two things and find the resultant. So I'm going to do them now really quick. You can do them at home too. And then we'll compare. Or at the very least, you'll compare. Make sure I didn't do anything wrong. 2,000 squared plus 784 squared. Definitely seems too small. 2,000 squared plus 784 squared. All right, so a little bit bigger than the 2,000 Newton force. Uh, I'll just round it to the nearest Newton, 2,148 Newtons in the direction. Make sure you're in degree mode. About 21.4 degrees. So I can make a statement here. The resultant vector, this net force, is whoops, 2,000, I'll just it, 2,148 Newtons. And for the direction, we could say 21.4 degrees below horizontal. It'd be incorrect for us to say um, 21.4 degrees um, uh, south of east, uh, because we have no idea that the cannon is pointing east or any direction. Um, in fact, and also uh, pointing straight down doesn't imply uh, south. South is a is a direction, either like ahead of us, behind us, left or right. Down is down. It's not south. Like I don't point to the sky and say that's north, right? So uh, this is a way you could state that um, resultant vector. So having done part A, we can now do part B, and we don't need to do any new math. The equilibrium is opposite to the resultant. So this equilibrium vector will remember opposite vectors have the did that again. Opposite vectors have the same magnitude but opposite direction. And so that'll be it's kind of off my screen here a bit, but the equilibrium will be pointing up and left and it will be 24 point 21.4 degrees above horizontal. Like so. And our understanding is that if the, the clown's being shot to the right, this equilibrium will be to the left. So in that example, our triangle of forces wound up to be a right angle triangle. Let's look at another example. Um, in this case, we're going to talk a bit more about um, headings and ground speed of a plane. The, what we're doing now can also apply to a boat um, uh, riding along a river with the current or in an ocean with the current for that matter or with the wind blowing, or both. Uh, but we're gonna keep it simple. We're just gonna talk about a plane that has a, um, a heading, which is the direction in which a vessel, so like plane or boat, is steered to overcome other forces like wind or current, with the intended resultant direction is the bearing. So heading is kind of like where you point to go. And then obviously you have your wind or current, and the bearing is where you do go. So it kind of makes sense, obviously, in like in this diagram, if the wind was blowing south in a suddenly direction, if I wanted to get, you know, if my destination was strictly to the east, well, I definitely would want to head a little bit north of east so that the wind blows me back down on course. Otherwise, if I had, if my heading is east and the wind is blowing south, then my bearing, I'm going to wind up uh, a lot south of east and I'm going to miss my destination. So, um, Kind of paralleling what we just uh, learned there, uh, ground velocity is the velocity of an object relative to the ground. It is a resultant or bearing velocity when the heading velocity, which sometimes call air velocity, and the effects of the wind and the current or the current are added together. So um, air velocity or air speed is just kind of the velocity where the where your your where the plane is. Uh, where the plane is pointing, you have your wind and current velocity, and the ground velocity is the actual result 
where the plane actually goes. Um, it's sometimes called the ground velocity because somebody on the ground, this is what they would see happening to the plane. They might see the plane pointing in a slightly different direction, but the wind will be blowing it um, on this particular course. So we're gonna do a problem. Um, we have a small plane and it desires to reach the location exactly north from its current location. Uh, so that means we know the bearing. The bearing we want is straight north. We have a steady wind blowing at 80 kilometers per hour and it's uh, north 45 degrees west, which is pure, purely northwest. And we have the plane has an air velocity of 300 kilometers per hour. So um, uh, just a small thing here, you might, you might be saying, well, velocity has a um, speed and direction. Right now, we don't know the direction of this air velocity. So that could maybe could be worded better. But right now, the air speed of the plane is 300 kilometers per hour. We don't actually know the heading. We want to find the heading so that we'll fly straight north. So fairly relevant problem. So let's just draw this out a little bit. So I want our plane, we want our plane to be, uh, to be, um, to have a bearing that's north. Um, and we fly in a direction kind of north to the east. And then this diagram is not really to scale. And we know that's 300 kilometers per hour. And the wind is blowing northwest and the wind is gonna blow us back on course. And so the wind is 80 kilometers per hour. So yeah, obviously this diagram is not to scale. Those two sides would be much different than length, but it gives us just a, a starting point, right? Um, our goal in this question is to determine the heading of the plane. So we're trying to find the heading. So which direction we have to fly. So how many degrees east of north do we have to fly? And eventually we'll find the ground velocity of the plane. So I'll just call that, I'll just maybe might make a R for resultant vector over there. We want to find the size of that vector too. We know its direction, it'll be north. Um, so we have um, right now only two sides in our triangle, not enough to solve it. However, um, we can get a bit more information because uh, we know that the wind is blowing northwest. So what does northwest mean? Well, it means um, either 45 degrees west of north or 45 degrees um, north of west. And because the resultant ground velocity is pointing uh, north, these two lines in this dashed line are parallel. And we have what it kind of forms a uh, Z pattern from your grade nine math course, or if this is west and this is north, you kind of know that it's 90 degrees. And so we know this angle too has to be 45 degrees. And now we have enough information to solve this triangle. And specifically, we want the angle theta and the size of the resultant vector. Um, notice that we do have a side angle pair um, in this triangle and angle theta is uh, clearly going to be acute. So we have no problems just setting up the sine law. Sine theta over this opposite side, 80 kilometers per hour equals sine 45 over 300. And so theta will be the inverse sine of 80 times sine 45 over 300. So uh, let's do that now. And then we'll have our, we'll have our heading. 80 sine 45 divided by 300. And again, no problems with the ambiguous case that angle has to be acute. So our calculator will just spit out that acute angle. So this, I'm just going to say 11 degrees. I got about 10.9 degrees. Um, so our, to kind of answer the question, our heading should be, the desired heading should be north 11 degrees east um, in terms of true bearing or azimuth bearing that would just be 011 uh, degrees whichever you prefer in this question since the direction original of the wind was like north 44 degrees west it makes sense to kind of use this notation here so we've got the heading we know which direction we should point so that the wind will blow us perfectly on course 
And just as a bit of an extra thing here, we're going to find the um, ground velocity. Um, so uh, now that we have, um, oh, I guess I can't find it directly. We'll have to set this up. Uh, now that we have uh, angle theta uh, at the bottom, uh, there are uh, lots of ways that we could uh, go about and find R. Um, I'm going to use the cosine law just to make sure I get um, tying a bunch of rules here. But we will need this turning out. It will be a, an acute angle, or sorry, an obtuse angle. Because we have 180. The original angle we knew was 45, and theta is 11, which makes that remaining angle across from the resultant 180 minus 45 minus 11 makes it 124 degrees. And so now we have all angles and two sides. So um, you could use the sine law if you'd like. Uh, I'm just going to use the cosine law to mix things up. So the size of that ground velocity resultant vector, I'm going to be using the cosine law. So I have to square root uh, 80 squared plus 300 squared minus 2 times 80 times 300 times the cosine of 124. Now, you could, at home, you could use the sine law as well. And we should, uh, if we're all using the same numbers, we should get the same result. 300 squared minus 2 times 80 times 300 mm -hmm. times the cosine of 124. Don't forget to square root. So the plane will be moving a bit faster, uh, 351 kilometers per hour, uh, which actually makes sense, right? Like the plane's flying uh, north, um, and it's just a little bit west. So it's flying, you know, mainly north, and the wind is, has a strong north component too. So, you know, we're definitely going to get a bit of boost uh, in the northern direction. The, the fact that the wind is blowing slightly to the west um, um, kind of cancels out with, with the the fact we're going to the east. Um, and we get getting that bump. It kind of you can just think it in terms of common sense. It makes sense that our ground speed, our ground velocity, was a bit faster. So if you wanted to, you could say that the ground velocity that resulted is 351 kilometers per hour north. That would be the ground velocity of the plane. All right, and this kind of uh, this kind of problem you could do with um, boats uh, on an ocean current. Um, uh, in this case, we had given the heading and the wind. We kind of found the ground speed, um, but also if you knew the um, resultant speed you needed and the wind, you could figure out how fast and what direction you need to fly. Uh, but also, if you knew the resultant, the ground velocity you needed and the air velocity of your plane or whatever, uh, you could calculate what the wind was such that it blew you onto that course. So you could solve for any one of these three things, but the setup is kind of the same. You draw the air velocity plus the wind giving you the ground velocity. All right, we're gonna solve one more problem today. So the tension problem. So you guys can imagine that You've seen lots of things hanging by wires. You can think of a, like a photo or a picture frame attached to your wall, kind of hanging by two nails, kind of the same idea. And we have this weight being supported. Um, and what we get is we get two tensions in these wires, a force um, along those wires that's holding the traffic light up. Um, we know the weight of the traffic light. Uh, which is the force of gravity acting on the traffic light. And we want to know what the tension in these wires are. This could be useful because, you know, if you knew the material and the length of your um, of your wire, um, you know, after a certain tension, the, um, the, the, the stress in that wire is too much for certain materials and it would snap. So you'd want to make sure you knew, you know, for this weight of traffic light hanging from these wires, you'd want to know what the tensions would be and want to know that's well within what the uh, this material can handle. So it's like a useful structural problem. Um, ours is kind of a simple problem, though. So what we've got here is a physical diagram of the situation. So note, these vectors, the way they're drawn, are not being added together right now. They're all kind of tail to tail. 
Um, it's a physical description of the problem. You got gravity acting down and the tension in the one string pulling the sign up and left and the tension in the other string pulling it up and right, kind of balancing out gravity. <clears throat> uh, to solve this problem, we're gonna draw a triangle of forces. Now, if we think about it, this traffic light is just hanging there. And what that means about the resultant is that the resultant is the zero vector, or in terms of physics, the net force on this traffic light is zero. The tension in the first string plus the tension in the second string or wire plus the force of gravity is zero because that traffic light is not moving. So if we were to draw that as a triangle of forces, which is how we're gonna solve this problem, it would look like this. We have tension one acting up and left. We have tension two acting up and right. And we have gravity acting straight down. And we know that that, that forms a closed triangle. The net force is zero. Um, might add a little note there. The resultant is the zero vector. So it forms a closed triangle. And we know the force of gravity is, in this case, 2,500 newtons. And our goal is to find the tensions. Now, in this particular problem, you'll notice the angle is 10 degrees on both sides. There's some symmetry here, which means both tensions will be the same. That also means in this problem we have, we're gonna have an isosceles triangle. How do the angles work out though? Well, it's the, um, the there's lots of ways you could look at it, but the angle with the horizontal with those tensions is 10 degrees. So if you can look at T1 and imagine this dashed line is the, the horizontal, or if you wanted to imagine this as like something hanging from a ceiling, then that 10 degrees would go here which would make this 80 degrees since that's this dashed line is horizontal and gravity is going straight down. Um, in the same way, we know that this isosceles triangle, T1 and T2 are the same. So we would have 10 degrees here and 80 degrees here. 80, 80, 20 adds up to 180. You can, you can have different lengths and different tensions. And so in that case, you just have to use whatever angles you are on the diagram, and this would be tweaked a little bit. But here we have an isosceles triangle. It's all set up. We're ready to go. We actually know all the angles in just one, one side, so we can use the sine law to find um, either one of these guys. It'll be the same. So we'll be using the sine law. Um, I suppose I should, uh, I'll just leave that as a little note there. Um, so let's find, let's set up the sine law for T1. The size of T1 over the sine of its opposite angle, 80, equals 2,500 over the sine of 20. The opposite angle to the force of gravity is at 20 degrees. And so now we can find T1 which will also be the size of T2, uh, 2,500 times the sine of 80 over the sine of 20. And we know their directions too, right? So right now we're just finding, when we're finding the tensions, it's usually just like, what's the size of the force of tension? 2,500 times sine 80 divided by sine 20. About 7,198 newtons. All right. Um, and so, yeah, that could be useful because, you know, you might know information about your wires. Like, you know, if these wires have a tension that exceeds 10,000 newtons, they're going to snap. And so you'd want to, you know, you'd want to know that you're safely within those specs, right? Um, so we've solved uh, three different um, uh, kind of like physics problems. Uh, and to be honest, many of you guys probably had the tools to solve those kind of problems. We reframed them in terms of uh, adding vectors um, and our new um, our new uh, terms result in equilibrium. So what's left for you guys to do, excuse me, is just uh, try some practice. Uh, it's the usual. I've got some pra uh, some questions from the McGraw-Hill Ryerson text. PDF is on on Brightspace for you guys to have a look at. 
Um, please let me know if you need anything. Um, keep up the good work. Uh, stay well, and we'll see you guys soon.